There's no chain too hard for him to break. Hallelujah. Well, I want to invite you to your seats for just a little bit. Be seated in the Lord's presence today. We welcome you into this house of joy and excitement. And again, we welcome all of our folks online and our hubs and the leaders. We love you. We thank the Lord for you. I want you to go to the book of Exodus. We're really just going to pick up exactly where we left off on Wednesday night. If you haven't watched the message as of yet, I would suggest you go back and you see part one of what the glory of God produces in us. This much like the deliverance messages I started preaching years ago. The first Wednesday night I got up and I said, hey, I'm going to preach on deliverance from demons. I was in an understanding with myself that maybe it would go for two or three, perhaps four weeks tops, and we ended up having 45 straight messages on deliverance and teaching deliverance and then a team being built and then deliverance bursting forth in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people's lives all over the world. And so I don't know exactly how long I'm going to preach through the Bible expositionally book by book and phrase by phrase on the glory of God. But I feel a little bit like Isaiah. Remember when Isaiah said, Lord, how long am I supposed to say these things? And the Lord said, till I'm done with you. Till I tell you to quit saying it. And so I want our church to be bathed in an understanding of the presence of the Lord because I have been on an understanding as of late, preached on it just yesterday, I preached on it at the Hub Conference as well, and that is the American church has bowed down to the golden idol of influence, and we have forsaken Holy Spirit authority. And I no longer pray for influence. A blue check mark does nothing for your life. Millions of followers does nothing for your life. Best-selling books, blockbuster movies, they help people, but they do nothing in the realm of authority. Those are levels of influence. And I'm done with trying to gain influence, but I think we're just getting started well on learning to walk in authority. And the only way we can understand the real authority of God's Word in our life is to not only read it and heed it, but to literally see what does it look like when the glory of God invades us. And not just in this tent in a gravel parking lot, what does it look like when your home is a haven of peace for the glory and presence of God to rest in? You see, when people walk in your house, they ought to immediately recognize a lack of chaos and a presence of peace in your home. No matter how chaotic it may be with, you know, kids and grandkids and toys and, and dogs and cats and, and visitors coming in and out. Listen, your house ought to be so absent of craziness and chaos that when people walk in, even when there is levels of disruption, there's peace in your midst. This is the season when marriages are going to be baptized in peacefulness. You're going to take the gloves off and get a wash basin out. And you're going to quit punching each other spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and dear God, physically. And you're going to start washing each other's feet. It's a new level. Couples in this room need to commit before the Lord like my wife and I have to start having communion in their homes. Once a week, if not every day. This morning we sat in the glory room, just let a little worship music play, and my wife and I partook of communion together. There's power in that. Yesterday in Orlando, I was getting ready to preach, and my son, Hudson, came over to me, and he sat down at the table. He said, hey, I've been watching, obviously, your stuff you've been saying, and he said, would you, would you have communion with me in this restaurant? Absolutely, I will, right here in this restaurant. Let's roll, son. We ride in five minutes. There's been a new level of just cleansing in my life. My prayer time has become so much more intense and less boring. You say, well, preachers ain't supposed to say stuff like that. Well, people are boring because their preachers don't say stuff like that. 
Bible reading has so lit me on fire. You would not believe the tens of thousands of people all over the world right now that are saying, my goodness, I never knew that was in the Bible. I never recognized how fun it was, how joyous and peaceful it is to read the Bible. Even those huge King James multisyllabic names that when you read them, you feel like you're practicing tongues. It's just been happening. The Lord's just been moving in alarming ways in my life. You know, I love to give. We just did a generosity conference. Got getting ready to put out a, a book on the generosity journey with charisma. And I, I love to give. But you know, the Bible says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. You know what I'm finding in this season of my life and our ministry and the church and my marriage and my kids? I'm finding that even my gift is e easier to operate in on every level. It's, it's almost like when I walk into a room, it's like these exit signs that the fire marshal made us put up. When I see them, that they're just, they're bright. You, you know what direction to go. And it's like I've been so much in the Word that when I walk into the room, I can see direction on people. I can see your entrance and I can see your exit. It's like God's like accentuating things. Like, and these are bright lights, but God just like accentuates things. Some of you are like, ooh, I hope he's not accentuating anything. No, no, no. <laughs> if it's something that needs to be dealt with, we'll deal with that privately. You see, public sin deserves public confession. But private sin needs private confession. So I'm not talking about I see sin on people. I, I just, I, I see things and the, the Lord just begins to stir me up about people. And, and I, I never would have imagined, Miss Billy, that I would have walked into that, but I should have listened to you in the chapel years ago because you told me it was going to happen. And so it's just beautiful as I'm personally, whether you get anything out of it or not, and you should, but as I'm personally dealing with this New commitment to wrestling with the glory of God like Jacob wrestled in God's presence. It's just, it's changing me. You know, when Jacob came away, we, we look at it as such a negative context because God touched his hip and broke his hip and his hip hopped out of socket and he walked away. And then when he died, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 21 that when he was an old man, when Jacob, Israel, was an old man, God changed his name. It says that he blessed both the sons of Joseph leaning upon the top of his staff and he worshiped. You see, from the moment he wrestled with God to the day he dropped dead as an old man, the Holy Spirit let us never forget the fact that when you get in God's weighty, heavy, presence he will give you a limp that you will forever walk with you'll always walk with a limp and we think oh that's that's just so horrible are you saying God's gonna cripple me no I'm saying God's gonna mark you and if you don't walk with a mark if you don't walk with a limp because you've wrestled with the glory of God in the secret place and thy father which sees you in secret shall reward you openly. If you're not walking with a righteous limp, you're missing out on all that God has for you in your life. The book of Exodus, I haven't even started preaching yet. I'm just warming up to you a little bit. I just feel like the Lord has so much he wants to teach us. I'm tempted to just jump in and, and look, if I get through the first point and we go six months in this series, so be it, Lord, so be it. I'm not rushing it. I'm not embarrassed by it. I'm not uncomfortable. I just want the Lord to move. I want the Lord to move in our midst. So Exodus chapter 33, in just a moment, I'm going to pick up verse 12. I'm going to tell you where we were Wednesday, just as a healthy expositional reminder. But I want to say a couple of things. The Lord won't let me start yet. Is that okay? You know, uh, I traveled... I travel with the guys a lot, some more than others, obviously. You know, normally Ricky and John and Pastor Jesse, and they're, they're almost exclusively with me, you know, on the bus when we go places. And I went with uh, some of the guys, and, of course, the Weavers and others uh, spoke over them. 
But I, I want to say something uh, to Ricky. I love this guy. I call him Rick Star. <laughs> the other night, the glory of the Lord fell in that room. Isaiah Saldivar was preaching. He'd left it all out. Whew. And uh, he and I and several preachers in the room went throughout 300 men. And we took the time. We laid hands on every man in that room. Praying for a fresh impartation of the power of the Spirit of God. Not, not that there's anything in us, but God flowing through us like a conduit, right? And so we got finished, or at least I did, and thought we were done. And we were praying at the altar, and it went for hours, literally, from start to finish. You don't have short services in a core group. And Ricky tapped me on the shoulder. They were sitting behind me. And Ricky tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, uh, Hey, Pastor, he said, you, you, you think you can lay hands on me and pray one of them? Fullness impartations on me. And I said, you better believe it. And I turned around and put my hands on both sides of his head and began to pray for him. And we prayed for a lot of folks. Our Spanish pastor was there. A number of our, our men and, and ladies as well were there. And I, I didn't even know they were going to be there. And it was just an honor to see them. It was, it was cool to see our family somewhere else in another context. And I was thinking about you, Ricky. And you have faithfully taking me a lot of places and that bus life is as frustrating as the day is long because something's always wrong with it Am I, i'm telling it man you can get in the flesh quick with that bus i'll be trying to sleep in the back and i'm like what are we doing on the side of the road but he just faithfully plods along fixes it prays under his breath and deals with it but here's what the Lord showed me. I know you got Hank in your arms. Would you stand up? I'm a bullet, right? It's what God called me to do. God's called me to be a bullet. But a bullet can never hit its intended destination if it doesn't have a tool that aims it, that carries it. To its intended destination and you have been a carrier of a bullet and you will continue because I trust you to be a faithful carrier of that bullet you, you will get the bullet to its intended destination every time on time but I'm gonna tell you the word of the Lord <laughs> don't get nervous on me Kelsey He was raised in revival, Brownsville. He's seen it, the best of the best, the worst of the worst. But I felt like the Lord said to me on our trip that you may be the delivery system for a bullet, but it's only because God's training you to be a bullet. You may drive but you hear the word of the Lord. You have an anointing to teach the word of God and you can bring revival to people that Greg Locke cannot. And I tell you, you receive that right now and I love you. You give the Lord a hand in this house. I'm telling you, you're a bullet, man of God. You're a bullet. You're a bullet. Chance, stand up. Now, I don't do stuff like this, especially when it comes to my family. I don't want to make them nervous. Chance likes to keep to himself. When I first met Chance, he was dating... Kiki then and he said hey my name's Chance I said good thing you get one <laughs> you get one son and uh, he takes good care of her but uh, he takes real good care of that grand youngin so I'll keep him around no I'm not going to speak that over you so don't get nervous right I'm not going to tell you that you're a bullet I'm not going to tell you that God's going to call you into the preaching ministry but here's what i do see I, I get to spend a lot of time with my son-in-law i don't spend a lot of time with him we, we're the kind of people we could get in a truck drive six hours and never say anything but hey what's up and be cool with it and not even be mad at each other maybe we'd be mad if we talked to each other right we're just that way little known fact about chance he has become in recent days an athlete par excellence I mean on 
on a scope that even far surpasses the abilities that I thought I had on a bicycle. He's a running machine. He's going to end up making Dr. Malachi O'Brien look like a sissy runner. But I want to say this, Chance, son, this morning I was looking at you, and sometimes I get these little visions, these little things that I see about people. You know what I saw? I saw a microphone in your face, but you weren't holding it. I feel like the Lord is going to use this righteous running that you have in you, that he's going to use your athleticism as a pulpit, as a platform, and you are going to, through the power and strength of God, accomplish things that are so amazing on an athletic level that people are going to put cameras and microphones in your mouth and you're going to say, I just want you to know Jesus gives me all this strength. The Lord gives me all this power. He gives me the ability to get up at 4 o'clock, run all these miles. And I see that on you. And I'll say one more thing. Years ago, there was a movie called Chariots of Fire. Dun, 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 dun. Remember that? Well, that movie was about a guy named Eric Lytle, L-I-D-D-L-E. And Eric was in the Olympics. He was a runner, one of the world's greatest runners. Now, he refused to run on Sunday, and when the Olympics fell on Sunday, he decided not to do it and actually got in another heat. That's a whole other thing. But here's what Eric Lytle, I speak this over you, son. Here's what Eric Lytle said. A press agent said, Sir, why do you run with such forcefulness and conviction? And here's what Eric Lytle said. He said, when I run, I feel his presence. And that will be your pulpit, son. You can be seated. Give the Lord some hand. Amen. I'm telling you, God's going to put a microphone in your mouth, and somebody else is going to be holding it, and you're going to give honor to the Lord for what he's doing in your life. Woo! Aren't you glad you came to church today? So I'll do it some more when the Lord says what he's got to say. I'll be in Houston tomorrow night at a, get this, this is crazy. This first one of these. I was invited to a prophetic conference. And, and I'm so new to that world, I don't know what I'm getting into. But I'm just going to go. I'll just close my eyes and start pointing them out. Good to see the Johnsons, by the way. We love you guys. Give, give these folks a round of applause. We love, these are preachers, our missionaries. Dwayne and Wendy, we love them. God's got them in a great space right now, a transition in the ministry, and we love them. We've laid hands upon them. We support them, and we'll continue to do so. Well, to God be the glory. Let's get into the word of the Lord. I don't want you to get nervous that you're going to miss lunch, but you might. <laughs> Exodus 33, what I talked about Wednesday was this. Here's what the glory of God produces in our life. We looked at surrender, freedom, provision, and reverence. Th those were the things we looked at Wednesday night. Go back. Get the cliff notes, watch the message. If you get in the glory of God, in the presence of God, you will be surrendered, you will be in freedom, you will have provision, and there will be a reverence to the things of God, and you will not walk around with casual approach to the things of the Lord. And we talked about that, but we had to stop. So I'm going to pick up in Exodus chapter 33 and show you the next thing that's in line that we receive when the glory of God is producing things in our life. Look at verse number 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Verse 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Watch this, verse 14, powerful. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. My presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. I don't know where we got this idea that being busy equals spirituality. Sometimes being too busy is a lack of spirituality. You've got to focus better. But notice, he says, and he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. He said, I know I'm supposed to lead these people. I know we've come out of the waters of the Red Sea, 430 years of Egyptian slavery, and I know we're going to that land that flows with milk and honey. But here's the deal, God. We're not going, at least with me being the leader, if you don't go with me. If your glory does not move with me, we are not 
going. I'm going to keep reading, but let me give you the point. Why is that? Because here's the next thing that the glory of God will produce in your life. Conviction. If you don't have deep-seated convictions that you will die for, you have a sissy belief system that will never change anyone, including your own life. In the glory of God, you will be filled not with convenience, but with conviction. And this man of God said, I know what you have for us. We know the promised land is our portion. But you hear me convictionally, Lord. If your presence and power and glory does not go with me, I'm not going to move. Verse 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? He said, how is the world going to know that we have found grace and mercy? How is the world going to know that we're saved, that we've been delivered? How, is, how are they going to know it? Here's what he says. Is it not in that thou goest with us? How will people at Walmart know that you're of God? How will people inside and outside this tent know that you're of God? How will people on the job know that you're of God? How will your friends and family at your next family reunion know that you are of God? Is it not that the glory of God resides with you? You see, you better get a conviction about the presence of God and quit this now or lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Schizophrenic gonna pray five seconds a night. Barely even pray for my food at Cracker Barrel lest somebody see me and then tip God a $20 bill to keep him off my back every month. I'm telling you, you better get you some convictions. You see, there are very few people that you will meet in your lifetime that are willing to die for what they believe in. But when the presence of God is a tangible, say tangible, tangible, reality in your life, you will be willing to die for it because every day you consistently live in it. And there's a lot of people that say little schizophrenic things like this. Well, you know, if it all came down to it, you know, I'm going to die for Jesus. Do not say that unless you with conviction live for Jesus. Because you'll never die for anybody that you don't live for. You'll never die for any belief system that you don't live for consistently every single day. And the fact that the American church has no convictions is a telltale sad reality that we have no glory of God in our midst. You can't fill a room with God's glory and then fill that room with people that have no convictions. He said... The world will know that we belong to you because your presence will go with us. But notice, he's going to get more convictional. You talk about some fortitude, he's about to do it. Verse 17, and the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Don't ever forget that. God knows your name. Here's what's interesting. God knows all of your sin, but he calls you by your name. The devil knows all of your names, but he calls you by your sin because he's the accuser of the brethren. Don't get it twisted. He said, I know your name. Watch this verse 18. And he said, I beseech. That's a military term in the Bible. It means to absolutely stand at attention, to beg, to get in line. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Hello. Show me thy glory you see if you sit around in a gossip line and you enjoy as the Bible says about a certain group of people all of the next best details of somebody's life you're full of something but it's not the glory of God if you can pass broken people hurting people homeless people hungry people wounded people naked people and you have no heart to want to help them you dwell in something but it's not the glory of God and he said Lord I want you to show me your glory now I'm going to be honest with you that is the most bold audacious radical thing you will ever ask your God show me who you really are 
In spite of what everybody says, in spite of the Sunday school material that I grew up with and the flannel graph sessions, regardless of what my pastor says, my husband, my wife, the political people. No, no, no. You show me who you are with no frills on it. That's a tall order. I'm not going to pass the microphone around and embarrass anybody, including myself, but I can promise you the majority of people in this room have never humbled themselves on their face before God and simply had one prayer. Oh, God, show me your glory. Wreck me in your presence. You see, listen. If that is the daily necessity of your heart, you cannot live convictionless. It's impossible. People say, oh, you know, they're just angry. No, no, no. We're passionate. We've got convictions that we live for, therefore convictions we will die for. You see, there's some things that I'll fuss about. There's some things we can argue about and still be buddies. There's some things that might get you a little bit more enraged than others. But you take all that out of the equation, let me tell you something right now. There are things that I will die for. And by the way, politics ain't one of them. Politics ain't one of them. But the inspiration and authority of the Bible is. I promise you, I'd take a bullet in the neck before I ever denied the reality, the prophetic nature, and the historicity and the revelation of this book we call the Bible. I'd take one right in the neck right now before I would ever cave to a culture that says, you've got to deny the Bible. I'm telling you, I'll die for it. I'll die for the virgin birth. People say, well, you know, you don't have to believe in the virgin birth to, to understand salvation. It is the impetus of salvation. And yet there are people that say, well, you know, I just don't think the virgin birth is that important. I don't think the, you know, the transfiguration of Christ. I, I don't think the, the deity of Jesus is something worth fighting over. He spent three and a half years fighting over it. With the Pharisees, there are some things you better die for. It's kind of like this convictionless society that we've raised. You know what 2020 did? It showed us how few convictions people actually have. Because the world started doing and the church started doing exactly what the government and all of their friends and family and their bosses told them to do. And what these weak, skinny jean wearing pastors told them to do. Right? Everybody laid down. Now listen, again, I'm not getting political. I'm just telling you what the facts are. That this is the most moral field fact that you're going to hear me say in the next few minutes. And that is, if you think 2020 was the end of it, listen, this year is about to get crazy. And if you don't have convictions, we're not hanging out for coffee. I don't have time to sit down and spend my days with people that love convenience and criticize and ridicule those of us that have convictions. Don't have time for it. I'm not looking for amens this morning. You can shout, you can throw tomatoes, you can stay, you can leave, it don't matter. The glory of God gives you things that you will die for. Things that you won't bend about. You will say with the Hebrew children, God's going to deliver us from you, Nebuchadnezzar. But if not, know this. We will not serve your gods nor bow down to the golden image which thou hast set up. Well, we're going to put you in the fiery furnace. Put us in the fiery furnace because he'll become the fourth man in the fire. Because we're not going to bend. We're not going to bow. And God won't let us burn, sir. And I'm going to tell you theologically why I'm convinced the fire didn't burn them up. Because the fire on the inside was burning brighter than the fire they were standing in. And you better get you some conviction. <laughs> Moses said, show me thy glory. Verse 19. And he said, I will make all of my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. This is God talking about himself. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Because that's what makes him God. And you don't get to question his decision because he's God, not you. And he said, verse 20, thou canst not see my face. For there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me 
And thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass. While my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see, watch this, my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Here's a man that lived and died, literally, in his convictions, having only seen the hinder part. Of God's glory. He said, I want to see you in a way I've never seen you. And God said, okay, let me slow your roll for a minute. I'm going to do it. It's going to change you and everybody you come in contact with. You're going to glow like a light bulb when you walk down off the mountain. They're going to have to put a veil over your face. Because they're not going to be able to handle the glory of God that you've got on you. And they're going to be critical of the glory of God that you have on you because they don't have it on them. And when they're not glowing the way they should be glowing, they're going to be critical of the people that are glowing. You hear me? Because it shows up their lukewarm darkness. So he said, I'm going to do it for you, but here's the parameter, son. I'm going to put you up here in a cave, and I'm going to stick my hand over the cave's opening. So you can't see me in my fullness when I walk by. But after I pass the cleft in the rock, remember that song, old timers? Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in the... That's what he's talking about, the cleft in the rock. That's where he got that. He said, I'm going to put my hand there. I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to walk past you. And then I'm going to move my hand. You're going to open your eyes. And you're going to glow like a light bulb only seeing my backside. You're going to see the physicality of the manifest presence of God's hinder parts. And it's going to change you and everybody you come in contact with and people at a tent church thousands of years later. Show me who you are, God. Give me the whole ball of wax. Burn me with the glory of God. And God hit him in that rock. And God passed by. And the glory of God was seen on the mountain. As the mountain from the vantage point of the people, as we'll see, burned with a thick smoke and a darkness and a blackness because our God is a consuming fire. This morning I was in the office getting ready and I was going through all of my packages that I received since I've been preaching out of town the last few days. The museum pieces. Everybody's like, we can't believe he's got a museum. I'm trying to preserve so I can teach the word of God to people on a new level. And if teaching people the Bible bothers you, another church will accept you well. So I got an email from Miss Judy this morning. She had no idea what I was opening. The moment I opened her email, I was opening this box that I FaceTimed my wife and said, baby, you ain't going to believe what I got in my hand. Miss Judy was telling me about the mountaintop that God's now allowing us to plateau on and how we've had to go through some changes and some challenges and some loss and some growth and some persecution and all of that and how God's going to do a great work. And when she was talking about the mountain... Pastor Justin, you know what I was opening? Two rocks excavated in August of 1987 on the top of a charred Mount Sinai. I'm telling you, I, they're rocks. But I could feel some, I, I, I could feel them when I was holding them. They got burn marks in the side of it. In my office right now. God strike me dead if I'm lying. Right now, two of them. Burn marks on excavated rocks from Mount Sinai where the glory of God resided on a mountain, burned the rocks up. And I got two light-colored rocks charred on two different sides. Because where the glory of God is, he'll leave a footprint. And let me tell you something. God burned a mountain 4,000 years ago. And I still got rocks to prove it in my office. 
and you're going to tell me the glory of God resides on your life and you've not been marked by the presence of the Holy Spirit and you can still live in fornication, you can still live in sin, you can still run around and drink and act a fool and look at pornography and talk garbage to your husband and talk garbage to your wife and not want to go to church and not want to be a soul winner and not be somebody that shares your faith. You don't pray, you get mad when I talk about reading the Bible three or four times a month. I want to be marked by God. Well, you about to get burned up. And if rocks can keep the marks of the presence for 4,000 years, dear God in heaven, why can't the church keep the mark for 45 minutes? You get touched by him, you'll get some conviction. You won't be able to follow these preachers on the internet that just feeds you jello and shortcake stuffing. You can't handle Skittles no more. You gotta have some meat. You can't handle a bunch of trampoline bouncing clowns that wanna take three words out of context. Wear a half-naked shirt of his wife. Open it up and tell everybody how hot my wife is. I ain't got to wear a half-naked picture of my wife on my shirt for you to know she's hot. I'll tell you what she is. She's lit up by the glory of God. That makes her hot. She's burning with a passion for Jesus. People say, well, you know, I just, I can't stand it. When your wife and your daughter get up and they get to preaching, they get to praying. Don't you know that's out of order? You know why these preachers tell me that? Because they ain't got enough burning fire oil inside them to preach themselves out of a wet paper bag. And two women up in this church can stand up and preach rodeo circles around them. And because men of God want to lay down on the job, women of God had stood up. And men are like, well, I can't believe that these women are taking over. Hey, they ain't taking over. They're just running with the glory of the burning of God that's on their life. Look, I'm going to tell you something right now. I thank God. I, I, don't, I don't even know what happened, uh, uh, Brother Sam, on Thursday. I hope it was great, man. I hope you had a good turnout. I don't know what's happening. I know we're transitioning our youth ministry right now. But I'm telling you right now, the Lord's done showed me. In our student ministry and in our young adults ministry, the fire of God is about to fall in this church. And they're going to be the leaders of revival. They're going to be the carriers of God's glory. They're going to get burnt before we get burnt. And they're not going to be ashamed. They're going to dance undignified before the Lord. They're going to fill this tent up to overflowing. Firefall Conference ain't seen nothing yet. And the problem is the fire doesn't fail and some of y'all missed it. Y- y- y'all too busy worried about what somebody said about me on Facebook. It's time to get on your face in your prayer room, in your prayer closet, in your shed. Take some stuff out and make room for God. You see, look, if you'll, if you'll find a spot and make room for God, he'll show up. He's just looking for somewhere to dwell. He's just looking for a spot to dwell. I've said it a thousand times. I'll say it again. The God that dwells everywhere desires to dwell somewhere. Why not your place? Well, why not your, your prayer hole, right? right? Why not that? He said, show me your glory. And so this man comes off the mountain in conviction. And you couldn't tell him otherwise. Listen, this guy fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I know some of our guys, they've been fasting. Some of our ladies have been fasting. A lot of people fast. I get it. But listen, he didn't even drink no water. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. As a matter of fact, if you're not in the glory of God, don't. Okay, you try to force the glory of God, you start doing things just because you want to do it. Let me tell you something. Fasting is not a trend. And it's been different. And I've watched them. And I've done it. And I sit back and I'm like, yeah, I know how you feel. Give me the pizza. Right? Because it's not my season. And when it's my season, it'll be my time. But here's what we do. It, and I don't minimize the struggle because I know the struggle's real. But we say things like this. Well, you know. And we've done it as a whole church. We say, well, you know what? 
I feel like the Lord wants me to get off Facebook for 30 days. That's cool. You probably better get off of it for 30 days, even if you ain't fasting. That's a palate cleanser. Just get off of it for a while because you've been eating garbage. But I, I know we say things like, well, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to do a TikTok video for 40 days because I'm fasting. Let me tell you something. That's all cute. It makes you feel better about yourself. I know. Well, I'm going to cancel Netflix for 40 days, but on day 41, I'm going right back to watching people shack up. Let me tell you something. Unspiritual people can fast from social media. Did you know there's only one kind of fasting in the Bible? Shout one. Mm -hmm. Buckle in. Talk about conviction. There's only one kind of fasting in the Bible. Food. That's it. I, I remember years ago, I said, I'm going to do a coffee fast. And I did. And I, I know God honored it. I went 76 days without drinking coffee. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to fast from coffee because coffee ain't a fast in the Bible. Food is. Right? You can fast from all the social media you want to, but if you ain't disciplined enough not to cut a hamburger in your gizzard, don't pray for the glory of God because it ain't coming. Hmm? Where's my chair? So you got a new kind of boldness now, right? It's a different level, different season. So listen, I know it's difficult. If you got conviction, it makes it less difficult. Makes it less difficult. See, I love deliverance, right? There's some deliverance generals right here. They took that down there to McAllen, Texas and setting that world on fire down there, and I love them for it. I believe in deliverance. I love it. We do it all the time. It could flare up right now. It wouldn't bother me on the live stream one single bit. But I'll tell you something. There's a whole bunch of you in the room and a whole bunch more of you watching. You don't need more deliverance. You need discipline. You need to get a gym membership. You need to get a bicycle. You need to quit eating garbage. Man, I'll tell you, I just feel like garbage all the time. That's because you feed yourself like you're a trash can. I got conviction, Right? What's up, buddy? I love you. I speak that over you. I love you to the core. I'd die for you. I'd tell you that right now. Come on up here. Come on, bother me one bit. I'm going to get his little pulpit up here next week. Praise God. Turn him loose. Let him preach. But let me tell you something. Some of y'all feel like garbage. Because if you were to really get in the presence of God and have an encounter, he'd let you know that you've not been taking care of your temple the way you ought to be taking care of your temple. Now, look, I know it's Sunday morning. I'm not trying to be mean. That's why I'm being cool and calm, and that's why I got cutie up here, praise God, because I could be a little bit more mean, and y'all be like, oh, ain't that so sweet? <laughs> Hair like that, I can say anything I want to up here, and you wouldn't even care. But some of y'all are like, man, I can't sleep at night. I got heartburn. I got headache. Man, my, my bones is aching. My, my joints is swole. I just, I just don't know what to do. Get in the glory of God and see if God don't convictionally tell you, hey, push back from the table for a couple of weeks and spend time with me in prayer. Me and you got an extra 40 you need to talk about. Don't get mad at me or do. I don't care. Some of you make Spiritual excuses for being lazy and unspiritual in your body. It's the facts. Pastors don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. He ain't bothering me, baby. He's all right. I mean, they don't, they don't want to talk about this kind of stuff. It's the facts. When you get in the glory of God, you will have meat that people do not know of. And it'll fill you up to a point. You'll have to go back to eating. You'll have to go back to drinking. You'll have to go back to doing your stuff. But there's only one kind of fast in the Bible. And here's why I say that. It takes conviction to be involved in it. I don't care if it's one day, two days, 10 days, seven days, 24 days, 40 days. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what you need to do is get in the glory of God and say, God, show me thy glory. And when God shows you his glory, he becomes the buffet every day. 
I better keep going. Chapter 34. This is the next one I'm going to get to. I, I, got, I got four more of them. I ain't going to get to them. Not because y'all wouldn't let me, but because I'm gonna, I want to steward the time well. Go to chapter 34. I want to show you the next thing that the glory of God will do in our life. Look at verse 29. We've been in Exodus, two services. Two services. So much there about the glory of God. Chapter 34, verse 29. Came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses, we just said it, wist not, had no idea, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Remember, and it's the only analogy of ridiculous nature that I can think of, but remember when you were growing up, they had them little thing called glow worms. You'd squeeze them, and their little abdomen would glow. Well, here's what God said. You get in my presence, I'll squeeze you, and you'll glow when you walk off the mountain. There'll be a glistening about you. You ever walked into a room, and I know you have, and somebody said, wow, there's just something different about you. That ought to happen to you all the time. You ought to shift atmospheres when you walk into a church service. You ought to shift atmospheres when you walk into the cubicle at work. You ought to shift atmospheres when you walk into a restaurant. You ought to be able to get around people and things just shift because they say, wow, there's something on you. Something on you. Matter of fact, while I'm thinking about that, I'll give you the point in just a moment. This was not even in the notes, but when I said that, the Holy Spirit said, okay, here's what you need to talk to them about. You know, there's a guy in the Bible, nobody wants to talk about him. He actually starts in chapter 36. And again, this is not even an outline. This is not any of it. His name is Bezalel. He loves him drums. Man, he's going to be a drummer. He loves him drums. He can't handle it. He come over to my house. He's got to beat on him drums. Grandpa bought him. Amen. But listen, so there's this guy in the Bible. I'm going to preach a whole message on it sometime. And so this is just, just, just coming to me right now. All right. His name is Bezalel. He's the guy that God told Moses to hire to build the Ark of the Covenant. That's a pretty big job. And all the tabernacle furniture, but specifically and especially the Ark of God, the testimony of witness. I was studying the other day and I found out that Bezel, L, obviously L is of God. Bezel in the Bible is a Hebrew word that means under the shadow or the presence. So the word Bezalel means under the shadow of God. His name means under the presence of God. Here's what's interesting about that, twofold. Number one, it's interesting to me that he's the first, shout first, first person in the whole Bible that God says, I have put my spirit in him, like Holy Spirit, capital S. It's the first spirit-filled person in the Bible before Jesus. That'll wreck your theology. But here's what's interesting. Did you know in Psalm 91 in verse 1, when the Bible says that we're to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty, the Hebrew word for shadow is bezel. His name literally means to abide under the shadow and in the presence of God. This has nothing to do with the outline, but man, I'm just feeling this so thick in this suit coat right now. Praise God. Thank you for letting me wear it today, Lord. Bezalel built the box, and all it was was a box until God touched it. He built a four foot box, overlaid it with gold, put a cap on it, stuck two angelic figures on top of it, had an empty spot right in the middle, staves, golden poles running through the sides because you can carry the presence, you just can't touch it. And that's a whole other message. And you know what God did with the box that Bezalel built? He dwelt on it. He dwelt on it. So what I'm saying, and the reason God gave me that, I think just this moment, is because... When you live, Bezalel, in the presence of God, you'll end up building something that God lands on. 
You'll end up building a marriage that God resides on. You'll end up building some kids that God comes down and touches. We'll build a ministry and a church that God dwells on. And God dwelt on a box built by a mere man because the very name of that man meant that he lived in the presence of God's shadow. Don't you tell me that the glory of God's not important. The most important spiritual religious artifact on the planet was a gold overlaid box that had the touch of God's glory on it because a man dwelt in God's presence to build it. That's a word. Wasn't even an expected one, but that's a word. Verse 30. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. They're like, what is this? This is like super jaundice. What's the deal? <laughs> and Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation, he returned unto him. And Moses talked with them. And afterward, watch this. All the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai, the smoking, fiery mountain. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. When he was in their presence, he had to wear a veil. Watch this, verse 34. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off. You see, although he radiated the glory, he was never greater than the glory. Did you hear me? We radiate the glory, but we'll never be greater than the glory. And when he talked with a man and a woman and a family and friends and job individuals and employees, he wore a veil. But when he talked to God, he took it off. And it says, middle of verse 34, and he came out and he spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. Now watch this. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. That's the third time it says that. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. i give you the final point of today's message we pick up later. What will the glory of God produce in our life? Surrender, freedom, provision, reverence, conviction. But in Moses' case, not to be overlooked and maybe even more important than the first thing we've talked about today is this. The glory of God will produce in you identity. You know why so many people don't know who they are? Because they don't dwell in God's presence. You will never know who you are in Christ until you dwell with him in the secret place and he reveals it to you. You see, some of you, your identity has been hijacked not by wicked people, not by nefarious demons. Your identity has been hijacked by your lack of dwelling in the presence of God. You stole your own identity and blamed everybody else. My daddy did it to me. I don't minimize that. My ex did it. I don't minimize that. There's forgiveness and spirits of unforgiveness and bitterness that we have to dwell with and deal with. But we have so abdicated the authority and the role and the responsibility of our own miserable existences that we think someone actually swooped in and stole our identity when in essence you gave up your identity and forfeited your rights to it because you spend time with everyone else but the God that can give you identity. You will never know who you are and what you're called to do until God tells you in secret who you are. And what God wants you to do. And when Moses dwelt in the secret place. Red button. He came off a mountain. 
down the steps, as it were. And when his feet hit the ground, everybody saw Moses the way God saw Moses. Did you hear that? And it was so, King James word, magnifical, mentioned one time in the Bible, it's a real word. It was so magnifical that they said, whoa, holy smokes, put a beach towel over that man. Put a veil on, put a mask on him. <laughs> we, we can't handle the glory. And I want to tell you something. I'll be 48 in two months. I'm halfway around the track. He's all right. Come here. It's doubtful I'll get another 48. And let's just be honest. I'd like to. I'd like to get another 68. Stay healthy. Mike, what's up, bro? But it's very doubtful. I got another round of 50 in me. Very doubtful. He is coming. And I'll say something. I love you, brother. You're a faithful man of God. You know that? You dance and shout and don't care what anybody thinks. And you shepherd me sometimes. Maybe better than I shepherd you. And I love you. And I speak life and blessing over you. But I doubt I got 50 more years. He wants me to. I never knew I could be 47 years older than my best friend, but it happened somehow. But you know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? I don't care what people know me for, don't know me for. I'm going to live the rest of my life wanting and desiring people to see me the way God sees me. You hear me? I don't know. I'm not even going to circle the wagons. not going to circle the airport. Some of you, you need to get some conviction. Get your identity right now at this altar. Come on, right now. Come fall on your face and say, God, my home needs to be an altar. My kitchen needs to be an altar. My office, my car needs to be an altar. My life needs to be a pulpit for the presence and the glory of God. Some of you need to come and say, God, pin me to this floor until people see me the way you see me. Show me your glory. Give me the identifying marks of the cross of Jesus and the power of the resurrection. Doesn't matter what they say. Doesn't matter what they write. Doesn't matter what they do. Doesn't matter who stays with you. Doesn't matter who goes from you. We better learn to live with a spiritual veil over our face. So much authority when we walk in a room, demons can't help but get mad and come out. Healing can't help but happen. Walk into a hospital room and cancer's got to get up and come out of that patient because you walked in with the glory of God on you. Get so much glory of God on you that you walk up in that divorce court and then papers dissolve. Get so much glory of God on you that your boss says, my goodness, you're like Joseph of the Old Testament. I'm going to put you over everything. You've got such favor. You've got such business acumen. We can call it a lot of things, but the Bible just calls it authority, and you need to learn to walk in it. Don't you ever waste another five seconds of your prayer time asking God for influence. Spend the rest of your life begging God every day for authority. I know people with influence in big churches that do not walk in the fear of God, that do not have a humility and a holiness about their life. I know pastors 
that have churches with 10,000 people and couldn't cast a demon out of a poodle pup because they don't walk in authority. They only have a level of influence. God help us. God help us. If you're here today to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, listen, if you're down here, stay here as long as you need to. Start making your way over. If you're in your seat to my right, your left, Miss Billy and the crew will be there. Get your name tag. We'll get your towels. We'll get you ready. We'll come over there with a mic. And we're going to baptize you in the name of the Lord. If you have been saved, but you have never been water baptized, you've never been immersed before the Lord and God's people, then you need to come today and do that. We got towels for you. No excuses. No excuses. I told the testimony this past Wednesday night when I started preaching on the glory of God about what happened with my friend, Pastor Mike Todd, at the North Georgia Revival at that church there. And I said, you know, what happened there is going to begin to start happening here miss billy walked up to me at the service she said pastor I, i've already seen it i already know i already know god's going to start healing people in those baptistry waters god's going to start setting people free in those baptistry waters. he's going to start doing it hey don't miss out on what god wants you to do today obey when you obey he'll set you on fire men we'll see you in the morning six o'clock hospitality room we're going to read the bible finish out genesis don't miss what God's doing in our men's ministry around here. It's beautiful. Don't miss what the Lord wants to do on Wednesday night. We're just going to go part three, glory of God. Next Sunday, part four, glory of God. We're going to preach on it until we believe it and until God shows himself in this place so greatly that we're concerned and consumed with nothing but how God sees us. If you need special prayer today, slip down here. If you're already down here, slip your hand up. We'll get somebody to come and pray with you, lay hands on you, talk to you in the name of the Lord and help you. We don't want you to leave. This may not be a, an official day of a mass deliverance service, but you can receive deliverance and healing right now in this service. If you've never been saved, get to the front right now. You need to repent and believe the gospel. Say, what words do I use? It's real simple. God, I'm a sinner. Jesus died for me. Forgive me of my sin. I accept you and you alone. That's it. It's not some fancy hocus pocus pixie dust prayer that you pray. A prayer didn't die for you. A person named Jesus did. You believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. You could be born again today, sir, ma'am, young person. Come on. Come on. Get what you need. Team's going to just worship. Just going to sing. We never have an official dismissal. I want you to stand all over the room if you're able to. We just say, we'll see you in the next service. We'll see you when, when the Lord decides for us to get back together again. So slip out. If you need to leave, go right ahead. If you need to hug folks, you want to stick around for baptismal celebrations, worship, prayer, staying at the altar, stay all day. Won't bother us one bit. But we never say we're done because God's never done in this place. Let me tell you something about these doors. They don't have a lock on them. But we're not worried about vandalism no no no. night security take care of that you know what we're worried about we're worried about letting you know that 24 hours a day these doors swing both ways and you can come get in this altar and pray anytime you want to doors are always open if you see cars all over the parking lot you see cars down there in those two administrative complexes that means we got staff here you need somebody to pray for you we'll pull aside we'll lay hands on you we'll pray for you in the name of the lord you come here every day you come here in the middle of the night don't make it you crawl up here get in the altar and say god Show me your glory. And I'm going to tell you something about this tent. If you've never been here when everybody's gone, it'll blow your mind. You know why? Because even when this place is empty, it's full of the presence of God. We've had people walk in here in the middle of the night all by themselves and fall plumb out in the glory of God. Listen, these doors are open 24 hours a day. You come, bring your family in here, pray anytime. You and your wife, 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, y'all get on unspeaking terms. Start acting crazy. Say, let me tell you what we're going to do. Get in the car. We go into the tent. And y'all drag each other up into this altar and start praying for the next few minutes and see if the glory of God don't fall on your marriage and you stop arguing about stupid stuff that you probably should have never been fussing about to begin with. There's a glory here. There's a glory here. Just rest in His presence. Take as long as you need. Get around. If you need ministry, get your ministry. But let's sing. Let's go to our baptismal celebrations.
somebody to pray with you today just slip your hand up we'll help you if you, if you need some help all right here right over here so i pray some healing on this dear man of god right here thank you brother things will change when you stop seeking god's hand and you start seeking god's face desire for you to come be here with us Lord would you dwell in this place with us King of glory we want you to fill this room Father when we walk in that we know we know the glory is here and everything has to change everything has to conform to your image in your glory Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said, it's like a mirror, it reflects onto us. It changes us, it transforms us, it sanctifies us. Father, may this be a dwelling place for you. We want you to come abide with us, Lord. 